so today we're here to talk about new media and uh, particularly it's sort of integration to our social and sort of political life. So before we go into anything further, what is new media, simply put? Well, there's no one definition uh, uh, of, of new media. There, there are, as you can imagine, with different people think of it very differently. But I suppose a good definition as any that I can think of is uh, media that uh, is either based on web, internet or mobile technologies is produced using one of those three technologies or is featured on any one of those three platforms. Uh, it could be, for example, a traditional masthead a newspaper, which is now publishing content on the likes of Facebook and Twitter and blogs and websites uh, that can also be taken as a facet of new media. But it's also the fact that there are uh, citizens in our country in particular, but also worldwide, who are using some of these new technologies and new platforms, which are most often free or cost very little to put up and set up uh, to produce content by themselves in their own language through writing, through photography, through audio and through video as well. So it's that, it's that uh, family, that ecosystem of media that you can capture in this term called new media, I suppose. Okay. So now, I mean, the term has now been sort of uh, synonymously sort of used with revolution and social mm. change, social movements sort mm. of that. Because it has the tendency or it has the uh, capability of sort of linking <coughs> like-minded individuals across the mm. globe. So do you see that sort of thing happening in Sri Lanka as well? Well, there are two parts to the, my answer. One is that it could also be echo chambers of the like-minded. And there is a tendency, Ali Parza uh, is, a, is, a, is a voice who's written a book uh, also, uh, it has a TED talk. Uh, and basically he says that those who connect using social media like Facebook, for example, are most often those who share a shared political ideology, for example. So it's not the case that new media suddenly brings together the unlike-minded, uh, different uh, uh, segments of society who think very differently. Uh, those each segment might use the same platforms, but they might be speaking to them uh, themselves. Um, the second part of my question is that I think it's a bit simplistic to suggest as some do, uh, that new media leads to revolutions. I think uh, this has come about after the events that we saw earlier yeah. last year in yeah. the Middle East. Uh, a notable publication uh, around three weeks ago from the United States Institute of Peace suggests that it's actually not the new media that led to any kind of social or political change at the time, but it was the rebroadcast of what was produced in new media by the likes of Al Jazeera Arabia. Al Jazeera Arabic and Al Jazeera English that actually led to some of the changes that we saw. So I think, to put simply, I think the, 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 the link between new media and revolution is tenuous. Uh, it needs to be fleshed out. It's not simplistic. By the mere introduction of new media, it does not mean that a country goes through a revolution. And by a country going through a revolution, it does not necessarily mean that there was new media either. What, however, you can say is that if you take Sri Lanka three years after the war, there is a lot of uh, conversation uh, on Twitter on the likes of Facebook in a number of ways uh, that simply wasn't there during war and would not have been there without these platforms also. There are conversations from around the country. They're not just limited to Colombo. There are conversations using a variety of media and there are conversations happening very interestingly in Tamil and in Sinhala as well, including with the diaspora. And that uh, blossoming of discussions, not all of it is very progressive, not all of it is very, very intelligent, not all of it is linked to politics, but that blossoming of conversation uh, has happened in the past three years because of this new media foundation. Okay, so I mean, you mentioned that it sort of doesn't only uh, sort of link people within Colombo and it's, there's also this sort of circulation in Tamil and Singhala as well. But one of the sort of main features or one of the features that has been put forward in new media is that there's this democratization of the content. But in countries like Sri Lanka, do you think the potential for such broad-based movements uh, is sort of limited due to people's limitations in terms of access to such tools? And I think if you take that argument to its logical end, uh, it's an absurd end because what you're suggesting, not you, but what the argument suggests is that 100% of Sri Lanka's population have to be new media savvy in order for it to have any kind of impact. And that's never going to be the case. We don't have 100% media literacy in this country, leave aside new media literacy. What it can, however, do, and we've seen this in many other countries internationally as well, and perhaps in the future in Sri Lanka as well, is that it can have, it can pack a punch above its weight, to use a boxing phrase. Uh, so it can have impact in Sri Lanka's politics, mainstream politics, in, in our social 
uh, transformation, uh, in our uh, processes of reconciliation, uh, in how we see ourselves, how Sri, how Sri Lanka sees itself in the international community, how we engage with the diaspora, in all of these spheres, it can have an influence because of the content that has been produced using these that percolates down through other media in ever widening circles. So what is published, for example, on a blog in Singhala might, as it is the case today, be published in a newspaper like Ravia and reach a, reach a very different readership through print. What is, for example, our program today that is rebroadcast uh, on, in addition to the terrestrial uh, broadcast, it's broadcast online, it's put up online, that reaches a very different audience. The transcript of our discussion might reach a very different audience. So it's not just the, 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 the original new media production that is of value, it's also how it's taken up by other media and spread as well. And that happens over time, so what, uh, an, a phrase that you use with this is called a long tail. So what we are discussing today might have value even three years or five years down the line because it resides on the web. Okay. And so somebody can five years down the line also listen to our discussion. Uh, they don't have to pay anybody anything. And it might have an impact to that person's work at the time. We don't know what that influence might be. But that is why it's a, you say it has a long tail. It has a longevity beyond traditional media. And that's very, very useful. Because what you're suggesting is that the content produced even uh, in, in any particular year might have enduring value uh, on these new media platforms for many more years to come. Okay, so diverting a little bit from what we're discussing, again going back to the word social change and social movement, are there any sort of specific tools that activists uh, use in the uh, in this sort of new media thing that you can kind of elaborate on for us? Well, there are a number of tools. I mean, it depends on which activists in which country and in what context. A lot of the tools weren't developed for social or political uh, activism uh, to begin with. I mean, Facebook was not developed with uh, revolutions in mind. Twitter was a joke when it first started out because people said, what on earth could you say in 140 characters? So the world of mainstream media and journalists just laughed at these platforms and that they were only good for sharing cute kitten videos and possibly where you and your boyfriend had coffee and did it uh, afterwards. You know, it was the very personal kind of communication. Today, they've of course been used for far, uh, far more uh, purposes and far more serious purposes. So you have the likes of Facebook and Twitter, which are possibly the best known, but you also have the likes of, for example, video sites like YouTube, which this program will possibly grow on, uh, Vimeo uh, as well. You also have, for example, SMS, and fax, let's not forget fax, email. Uh, but you also have platforms like um, Google, for example, which allows for collaboration online, working collaboratively on documents, for example. There are a lot of blogging platforms like Blogger and WordPress that have just blossomed this uh, almost industry uh, of new voices in any given country writing in their own uh, language uh, without having any, time, uh, any kind of editorial oversight or control. You are very much the author. Uh, uh, of what you would choose to write and publish. Uh, and so there are a number of platforms that allow for collaboration, that allow for cooperation, uh, that allow for uh, voices that are geographically dispersed to be featured in one location, that allows for voices that might publish one thing at one given point of time, but that allows for that conversation to be carried on over a longer period of time. And there are also platforms that, for example, uh, take uh, content from one platform and make it available on the other. For example, a very good uh, simple one is that if you put up a video on YouTube, you can put up a link to that video on Twitter and a longer description and embed that video on Facebook and embed that video on a blog. So you have one video that is now featured across a number of platforms. Okay. These platforms are today the likes of what I just mentioned, and who knows uh, what they might be five years down the line. So it's the use of these platforms for me that's more important, and not so much the platforms as, as specific platforms per se. Okay, so Sanya has one last question. Yeah. Uh, so in certain countries where this supposed revolutions took place over the, I mean, through social media tools, mm -hmm. uh, there were uh, things that were more sort of restrictions imposed on traditional forms of media, and then after that there were restrictions imposed on the new media as well, through the internet police and things like that. So in Sri Lanka, how yeah. much freedom do you think exists online? Well, the recent Freedom House report that looks at Sri Lanka, uh, um, the country reports suggest that the, the, the freedom that we enjoy is certainly not uh, as high as, for example, a Nordic country, 
but it's certainly not as bad as, for example, the United Arab Emirates uh, or China. So we're kind of halfway between. What's of concern here is not so much where we are ranked today in 2012, but where we've been heading. Uh, and I think if you take a look at the past three years alone, uh, with the number of sites that have been blocked extrajudicially, uh, with the number of sites that have uh, suddenly gone, uh, uh, you know, that have you know, been subject to what's called denial of service attacks, uh, with the number of journalists uh, who have been active uh, on these blogs having been forced into exile, uh, with the number of attacks that have come upon these blogs, with the number of court cases, etc. I mean, the, the list is, is quite long, unfortunately, that um, we see an increasing interest and interrogation by the powers that be about the content that's going up online, precisely because that content is contesting the, the dominant narratives in the country uh, that are promoted by the powers that be. So it's inconvenient for them to have that kind of content out there because it contests in a manner that mainstream media cannot. So my concern, my fear, is that the scrutiny is going to grow, and with that scrutiny, censorship and command and control architectures will also tend to grow. How successful they are, and they will be, is a matter for open debate. What we have seen, for example, if only out of Arab Spring, is that you can't you know, contain, censor, and control these in the way that you could do with me, uh, mainstream media earlier, in, in earlier years. So that's an open debate, uh, how Sri Lanka as a country will go. Uh, but I think once you have embarked upon this kind of uh, road where new voices are coming onto these platforms, it's very, very, very difficult to stop them. Mm -hmm.